So it was a little difficult what we talked about this morning, I'm aware of that. But to just get a sense of the mechanics as such, we're going back to, of course, I think we have a natural need. We, we want to know the I. I mean, there's this, this really weird way of talking, but it's true for us. We go to find ourselves, right? We have that. We have that kind of this, this, this wish to go somewhere, to maybe climb a mountain, to find ourselves. So there's definitely a sense of, yeah, there's this I, but I don't really know what it is. So this is Buddhist joke. You, 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 you go out to find yourself, come to India, and then you, you find there's nothing to be found. Right? Like when you encounter Buddhism. But it's not like that. Actually, it's not like there's nothing to be found. Because of course there is an I. There's I, there's other, everything. The Buddha himself said that I don't have a problem with what the world asserts in terms of saying this is a mountain, this is this, this is I, this is others. It's just labeled, but because it is labeled, it exists. And not labeled randomly, but based on certain functions and certain parts. So that is conventionally, I agree. It's I from that perspective other from this perspective. It's beautiful from my point of view. It is ugly from another person's point of view. And the problem arises when I believe it is truly beautiful, right? Okay, we just I just had a talk with someone saying, well, what about opinions? What about views, right? We all have opinions. I have an opinion about something in relation to what I want, okay? Mm -hmm. So in relation to my what my needs, my upbringing, I believe this to be the right view. But then I believe this is the only right view. And if you disagree, you're wrong. But then from your perspective, you hold another view, which in relation to your needs, in relation to your interests, is the right view. So both are right views, right? Because we, we label right view based on the fact that this suits you suits your psychological makeup and in my case it suits my psychological makeup to tell you the truth i think the best way to live is to be a nun really i believe that i'm not saying for you but if i were you i would because if i were you i'd be me in your situation and so therefore i would still want to be a nun i'd shave my hair and become a nun but that's for me personally but for you no, you feel maybe, oh my God, you feel like restricted, you feel like you, 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 you know, you're, you're forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do. So then it would be totally inappropriate. From your perspective, it wouldn't be appropriate. From my, it is. So from a Buddhist point of view, there is harmful and non-harmful in the sense that anything that brings us well-being is said to be beneficial in general and something that brings us uh, suffering is non-beneficial but this is on a moral level where for instance we are all the same in that we don't want our stuff to be taken we're all the same in that we don't want to be killed okay no matter where you're from no matter whether you're an animal even an animal so no living being wants to be killed right Unless you're terribly suicidal, but maybe you would actually think a serial killer is a good thing. I'm not sure. For yourself. Okay, if you really want to die and there's someone who says, look, I can do it for you, you may actually be grateful. But in general, we say murder is bad because murder implies you're killing someone against their will. And so it's bad. You're doing something that they don't want. That's why we say murder is bad. Okay. But if you go look at other things, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm back at BB, but you know, with BB, half the country, okay, people tell me not half the country voted for BB, but anyway, whatever it is, quite an equal amount of Israelis voted for BB because the same action for one person, it's good for another person, it's bad. So here, it's not so much about, it's not like saying, okay, we should murder every Israeli, right? And half maybe are suicidal, 
and, and said, oh yeah, great, and the other half. That's not the case. We're not talking about these actions, which we can say are ethically wrong. Mm -hmm. Because we all, in relation to what we all want, we would say they bring, what we, they bring happiness to people and they don't. Okay, in general, certain things. We all need food, we, all, we don't want to be killed. But then there are differences between us. One person wants more agricultural fields. One person wants more high rises. So if Bibi gets rid of the agricultural fields, I'm not even sure he does, but I overheard some conversation. Yeah, that's, that's, okay. Then the person who, who wants to get rid of agriculture, they're like, yeah, Bibi, great, I want these high rises. So from their perspective, it's good. From another perspective, it's bad. What is it? It depends, right? On that, it depends on that person, it's good. It depends on that person, it's bad. So, but we need to respect the other person because in the end, they're just like us. We all want to be happy, we want to live our life. We all have the right to do it, which is why I'm just as important. So the idea of emptiness is getting at that. There is no solid I that makes me the center of the universe. From my perspective, this is I. From your perspective, you are I. From my perspective, my happiness is more important. From the perspective of my mind, my happiness is important. And, and I experience my happiness, but you have an equal mind that wishes that it's a nature is the same nature, just superficial differences in terms of, you know, different views, different upbringing, different religion. But that's pretty superficial. Deep within, we have the same nature of mind, basically. So why would the happiness of my mind be more important than yours? This is where love and compassion come in. Love is the wish for someone to be happy. My happiness is by no means more important than yours. But it feels that way because it feels like you're inherently other, you're inherently over there, I am here, as if it like it was my natural right, right? So therefore I can act in such a way. But actually that's just me labeling. I here, you're there. Yeah, well, you are, you are the center of the universe from your perspective. Am I the center of the universe from my perspective? So we're all the center of the universe. We're all equally important. Everyone's happy is equally important, okay? That's what Buddhism is about when we talk about love and compassion. But not because love and compassion are good because Buddha said so. No, they bring us happiness. Even me personally. If I have love for other sentient beings and I never have the opportunity to act upon it, I'll be happier and you never know I have happy, uh, I love you. And so it won't directly benefit you. My own love and compassion directly benefit me and indirectly if I act upon it, will benefit you. But love and compassion cannot be forced in the sense that if I hold a very strong wrong view with regard to I, 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 it's not going to come. So initially, we all have a very strong view with regard to I, I, I. Okay? And so we, we try to be loving. You know, we're like, we're like putting on a space suit <coughs> and try to dance the nutknecker. Nutknecker, you know that belly? Right? Or swan leg. Okay? But now as, as, as spiritual practitioners, whatever we name, whatever label we give ourselves, right? So we try to practice love, but it doesn't come naturally. We, we're not, it's like put others before self. We try, but it feels awkward. It's like, you know, when you wear a space suit, the space suit is our misapprehension of reality. So we're trying and we're getting better at it. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a difference between all space suits the same, but with habit, it becomes a little bit more elegant. You know, the first time it looks awkward, but it becomes more elegant. But what we're trying to do is take off the spacesuit, okay? But we can take the spacesuit only off if we're better with the belly, become more flexible, okay? So our mind becoming more flexible through love and compassion that we practice already now, which we would have effortlessly with our misperception we're gone, but it's like, imagine that spacesuit. Initially, it's so stiff because of our misapprehension, so we have to make it more flexible before we can actually take it off. So we're already moving in that direction of generating more love, compassion, which makes our mind more flexible. And as one of my, one of my classmates, I had a, a classmate in my, uh, he was a very high lama. His name is Maturupache. 
Matul. Ma means cook. Dul means emanation. He was the cook of the fifth Dalai Lama and happened to be a great uh, practitioner. And over many lifetimes, he evolved to become a great Kagyu teacher. He's now a, a, a wonderful Kagyu Lama, I should say. So he has got some great insights. And one time I, I said to him, how come that compassion, actually when you have compassion, when you look at the problems of other people and you generate the wish to remove them, how come that that helps with our understanding of no self? And he said something, I never forget, I'm not sure you find it that effective. It was during the debate. And he said, when you focus on other suffering, you realize that the chair you're sitting on is empty. Mm -hmm. When you're focused on, right, usually it's like I, I, I and my problems. They seem really heavy. But when you, when you practice compassion, you're with the problem with the other person, your own problems, you forget about yourself, right? You forget about yourself because you're so involved with the problems of others. And that's a, that's a relief because as long as I feel I, me, and mine, I'm so busy, so my problems become unbearable. But when I focus on others' problems, right, that habit of focusing <coughs> on my own becomes lessened and there's more of the worry about my problems because a problem is only a problem as long as I call it that, right? Oh, it's a problem. I talked about it yesterday. There's been research on it. If you call a problem a challenge and you believe in it, you act accordingly. If you call it a problem, you feel depressed. So it's labeling again. A situation is neither a problem nor a challenge. It's not good or bad. It depends how it seems to you in relation to you. And then based on that, you label it possibly a problem. But now it's a problem since you labeled it. But it feels like, no, it's a problem. I labeled it because it's a problem. It's actually the other way around. I labeled it a problem and that's when it becomes a problem. If I label it a challenge, but it needs to be still a basis of imputation. We're not labeling randomly. But there's a lot of room for wiggle room. I mean, I can label that a chair and there's not much of a problem. It's not inherently a table because if it were, I couldn't use it as a chair. Okay. But it's, it's got similarity to other objects. So the lines between objects are pretty hazy. I don't even know where you start and where I end, literally, when we stand next to each other. Because which atom is part of your body and which atom is part of mine? Can you tell me? On a very subtle level, forgetting about emptiness, I don't literally don't know where your body starts and ends. It seems very pretty obvious, but that's just an illusion. <coughs> so, going back to this, with regard to, how do I get there? <laughs> now I really lost the plot. You need to help me. Let's check whether you paid attention. <laughs> how did I get there? I'm serious, I'm not. Uh, how did I get from there? Pardon? Mata Rupashi. That's right, that's right. Thank you. Oh, Mata Rupashi, yes. So, Mata Rupashi, what he said was like, if we really care for the other person and we, then we forget about the I. So there's this, how does this help us? There's a sense like, wow, I didn't think of myself the whole day and I'm still there. So you may dig deeper to check how does the I really exist. And as a result of that, your compassion grows again because if you don't find it, and that in turn helps the understanding of the I, how it exists. So that's why we talk about compassion and wisdom. Not only are they both parts of Buddhism, they're both two aspects of Buddhism, but they support each other. They make Buddhism complete. So they help each other to grow. Okay? So practice compassion, that helps your understanding of, of helps your wisdom. And your wisdom helps to grow your compassion. So, but in the end, the main aspect, the main thing we have to do for compassion to really come out of our mind, that is already there. It's all there. It's incredible. You have the you have this incredible ability to love and be compassionate and be there for everyone. And sometimes it comes through with your kids, you know, with other people. You can be so loving. But it's usually restricted by I and mine. Yes, with my children, okay. <laughs> Not with those children, okay? So we limit it because of the sense. 
So eventually we have to understand this separation we create between us and others, it's only conventional. It's not concretely there. It's a creation by the mind out of convenience, okay? Of course, we need to make sense of things out of convenience. The problem is we forget that it's out of convenience, just labeled, and now think it is labeled because it is that already. That's our problem, okay? That's our problem. So in the end, once we understand that, right now, I want myself to be happy. But when I understand that you are equally important, because there's no I that's more important, then your happiness is equally important. And when I wish you to be happy, that's love. And everyone I meet, no matter where they're from, no matter what is their superficial kind of, the superficial difference, they're all superficial. The differences between us are far less than what we have in common. But we focus in on the differences. Our religion, out, outer appearance, and it's skin deep, right? I mean, even the, the color of it's skin deep, rip it off and we look pretty much the same, okay? Take off those dead cells, you know? That little bit of nose or whatever, you know, a few features in the face, but mostly, we look so similar. So we focus in on the differences and differentiate. But we don't look at what we have all in common. And most importantly, we have this same incredible mind. Like a Buddha. Our mind is that like of a Buddha, except it's still covered. We're still in that spacesuit. What's underneath it? Same thing. Perfect belly dancers. Right? Okay? Does that make sense? That's really the idea. No? <laughs> no? <laughs> Questions at all? Mm -hmm. The following question: Why is it like this? I mean, why is this complication? Okay, why okay, okay. I'm glad why you asked that. Uh, let me get you asked that. Let me give you an example. Okay, let's say you shoot me with an arrow. Okay, I give you this. I give you this bow and an arrow, and you shoot me with an arrow right here, and I go, why? Where does that arrow come from? Who made it? Why is it blue? Why is it not red? Where exactly, right? We can ask those questions, but maybe let's pull out the arrow first. You see, why am I saying that? Because the Buddha didn't answer this. I'm pretty sure there's an answer, but right now our mind is beyond our mind to understand it. So usually it says it's always been like that since limitless time. We're not good with limits. We like concrete. That's our problem in the first place. We like a concrete beginning, middle, end, right? There's no apple, wrong apple, snake. No, nothing of that. In Buddhism, it says like, there's no story of a beginning. And even in Judaism, who made God? Where does God come from? You always end with some limitlessness, right? Whatever you're saying, what was before the Big Bang? Okay. I've seen those the other day. I, I went through like a website with documentaries. It said there's a whole documentary on what was before the Big Bang. I, I couldn't be bothered to watch it, but I was like, there you go. There's a whole documentary about it. So we always, it's always something. You know, where, where does it all come from? We don't know. It's not important because we suffer. So we can philosophically ask that question, but we shouldn't spend too much time on it. And I have no answer. It, it was always there. Unfortunately, that's the only answer I can give. And I think maybe our mind right now is we've it's kind of limited. We've limited our mind. We put on that space suit right now, and maybe if you took it off, it all became clear. But right now we're someone who's blind trying to understand what blue looks like. Right? First we need to develop the mind that can perceive blue and then it'll be there anyway. Get rid of the restrictions. So certain things we just cannot answer right now. Yeah. But there's an end to it. Where does it begin? We don't know, but there's an end. <laughs> Yes, you're right. We can also search consciousness, subject and object, right? To understand emptiness better. But that's actually more difficult. We're doing the self here. Right now, the self, the I. I bring in other things. I can't help it. But actually, the mind would be the next stage. 
The mind is difficult to understand. So definitely how the mind doesn't exist solidly. That's much harder. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it's just not the time to do it. But I would agree with you. If you find that helpful, though it's harder, go ahead and do it. Yeah. All right. I would like to do a meditation before lunch. <coughs> yeah, I know. Not much time. <laughs> um, so I was thinking... One thing I want to say, first level, I'll ask you about the self. Get in touch with the permanent I. <coughs> now, permanent means that it's not changing. Now, one thing I need to explain. If you have a sense, the I that sits here now is the same I that came in here after the break. Do you have that sense? Right? Or the sense when you, someone who's wronged you, like a week ago, when you see this person today, you go look at them and you say, that's the same guy. If you have that sense that this, that person yesterday and the person now, they're the same by implication, that means they're permanent because they haven't changed, they're identical. So if you feel the I that came into this hole and the I that's here now are the same, then there's... That's your sense of permanence, okay? So I don't need to explain this. I'll ask you to get in touch with that and do a little bit of analysis on that. If that really existed, what would that mean? Okay, we do a little bit of analysis on that. And then at the very end, at the very end, I'll ask you to focus on, like to end the meditation, you come to some kind of conclusion, a feeling there. After this analysis, like not finding it, hopefully, or whatever it is, you focus on it for a few moments and just allow for this to sink deeper. Okay? So for it not to stay on an intellectual level, but to affect you more on an emotional level. Let's try that. Does that make sense? Just focus on that feeling. That's all you need to do. I have, I have just a question. Why do you call it analysis? Analysis comes from the intelligence. Mm -hmm. like the, yes. the thinking aspect of it. But there are subtle levels of analysis. There's a very coarse thinking, but even an emotional mind is analyzing. I'm angry, they did this, they did that, da, da, da. So in the analyzing faculty, we are associated with the coarse intellectual mind, but every mind can, even the subtler mind, we're just less aware of it. When you're angry, you're still thinking, why did they say that? Why did they not do this? Da, 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 da. Right? That's also so analysis. It's an emotional analysis? It's well. an emotion analyzing, yes. But now don't do the emotional, because if you bring in emotions, it's dangerous to be carried away by the emotion. Use the intellectual mind, but then you focus on it, and just kind of allow your mind to be soaked by it. It habituates your mind and automatically it gets to an emotional level. Okay? Oh, you're here. You were there, right? <laughs> okay, great. I'm changing. You're changing, yes. You're closer by a highly recommend. <laughs> okay, so let's do it. We'll start with a little bit of breathing and then I'll say a few words and those are just suggestions and try to go through the analysis. Maybe hard, but let's try. Try to become aware of your of the sense of your eye being unchanging. This eye being the same as the eye this morning. 
Just allow for this to appear to your mind. If you were treated unfairly in the past, is there a sense the I right now? It's that same I that was not treated well. Now think if that I really existed. This morning's I and the I right now were identical. then the I would not be different, would not change from moment to moment. So even though the body changes from every moment to the next, since the cells are constantly changing, And I could no longer say, I've become taller, while my body has grown. I'm sick, and my body is sick. <coughs> I were as permanent as it appears, while the body is constantly changing. <coughs> 